Father, we thank you for all of your mercies. We pray that we may truly hear your voice. We're now in the fifth chapter of Revelation. Help us to see that it's talking to us. Amen. We're in chapter 5, verse 1. It says, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written. In Christ Object Lessons 294, it says thus, the leaders made their choice. The leaders, their decision was registered in the book which John saw in the hand of him that sat upon the throne. The book which no man could open in all its vindictiveness, this decision will appear before them in the day when this book is unsealed by the lion of the tribe of Judah. Testimonies, volume 9, page 267. The fifth chapter of Revelation needs to be closely studied. It is of great importance to those who shall act a part in the work of God for these last days. So it's particularly talking about Seventh-day Adventists. Chapter 5, we need to study that chapter. There are some who are deceived. They do not realize what is coming on the earth. Those who have permitted their minds to become beclouded into regard to what constitutes sin are fearfully deceived. Unless they make a decided change, they will be found wanting when God pronounces judgment upon the children of men. Now this is a message to Seventh-day Adventists. They need to study Revelation 7 or they will be deceived. They will not understand what sin is. Now that seems difficult for the church not to know what sin is. But that's what Ellen White says. They will not know what sin is. Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 109. In the revelation of the Lion of the tribe of Judah has opened to the students of prophecy the book of Daniel. And thus is Daniel standing in his place. He bears his testimony. That which God revealed to him in vision of the great and solemn events, which we must know as we will stand on the very threshold of their fulfillment. So Daniel said what would happen in the last days. He is standing in his lot. We are to understand the book of Daniel. We understand it by understanding the book of Revelation. In history and prophecy, the Word of God portrays the long-continued conflict between truth and error. That conflict is yet in progress. Those things which have been will be repeated. Old controversies will be revived, and new theories will be continually arising. Now I'm going to take just a moment to look at that. Old controversies. Well, we go back to the beginning. When Adam and Eve were alive, there was controversy already. Is Jesus the Son of God? That was the controversy. Is the law still binding? That's a controversy. Old controversies are going to be revived again. We're in them right now. The old controversy is Jesus, Son of God, the law of God. All these things are happening. But new theories will be continually arising. Now, those old controversies will have the new scholars dealing with them and saying things about them. So we need to understand what these things are saying. In verses 5 to 6, it says, In the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. Desire of Ages 243 says, 
Notwithstanding their boast that under the lion of the tribe of Judah, Israel should be exalted to preeminence over all nations, they could have borne the disappointment of their ambitious hopes better than they could bear Christ's reproof of their sins and the reproach they felt even from the presence of his purity. So Israel was in sin and they couldn't bear the reproach of Christ's purity. Patriarchs and Prophets 236 The lion, king of the forest, is a fitting symbol of this tribe, from which David, the son of David, Shiloh, the true lion of the tribe of Judah, to whom all power shall finally bow and all nations render homage. Acts of the Apostles 589 the Savior is presented before John under the symbol of the Lion of the tribe of Judah and of the Lamb which had been slain. These symbols represent the union of omnipotent power and self-sacrificing love. The Lion of Judah, so terrible to the rejecters of his grace, will be the Lamb of God to the obedient and faithful. The pillar of fire that speaks terror and wrath to the transgressor of God's law is a token of light and mercy and deliverance to those who have kept his commandments. Now, whenever we read in the Bible or the Spirit of Prophecy, there is a people who keep the commandments. Just because we have joined a commandment keeping, claiming to keep the commandments of God. That doesn't mean we are keeping them just because we joined the church. So we ought to think about that. Am I a commandment keeper? And of course, we all know instantly whether we are or are not. Only commandment keepers are going to heaven. Now, Sunday keepers get around that by saying, well, Jesus kept the commandments. That's the only one who needs to keep them. We don't need to keep them. And we have almost all of us believe that lie. But we're not going to heaven unless we keep them. And he gives us the strength to do it. Verse 8, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Review and Herald, September 29, 1896. As the high priest sprinkled the warm blood upon the mercy seat, while the fragrant cloud of incense ascended before God, so while we confess our sins and plead the efficacy of Christ's atoning blood, our prayers are to ascend to heaven, fragrant with the merits of our Savior's character. Manuscript 15, 1897. The angels who offer the smoke of the fragrant incense are for the praying saints. Then let the evening prayers in every family rise steadily to heaven in the cool sunset hour, speaking before God in our behalf of the merits of the blood of a crucified and risen Savior. Now we gave 16 sermons on angels. Angels are a true factor in the plan of salvation. They speak in Christ's stead. Luther, as a minister of God, he recognized that to preach was to speak in the stead of Christ. And today, every true Christian is to speak in Christ's stead. So angels are very important. We ought to review what was said in those sermons sometime to see if we still have it. Great Controversy 651, verse 9, And they sung a new song, 
saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. So we're hitting something very important here. We sing a new song, and it says, Thou art worthy. Who are we talking about? To take the book and open the seals thereof. Nobody has seen what's in those books yet. Here at Controversy 651, it says, The cross of Christ will be the science and song of the redeemed through all eternity. In Christ glorified, they will behold Christ crucified. Never will it be forgotten that he whose power created and upheld an unnumbered world through the vast realms of space, the beloved God, the majesty of heaven, he whom cherub and shining seraph delighted to adore, humbled himself to uplift fallen man, that he bore the guilt and shame of sin and the hiding of his father's face till the woes of a lost world broke his heart and crushed out his life on Calvary's cross. Well, who's that talking about? Well, we can say very quickly, well, that's Jesus Christ. But notice who Jesus is. That statement said Jesus is the creator. He created. Now, people who don't know better say the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit created, but that's not true. Jesus is the creator. He upholds the unfallen worlds. He is the majesty of heaven. The cherubs adored him. He humbled himself. It broke his heart and it crushed out his life on Calvary's cross. It's Jesus. There's no way around it. She's talking about Jesus. Not the maker of all worlds. That's the creator. The arbiter of all destinies. He's the judge. Should lay aside his glory and humiliate himself from love to man. Will ever excite the wonder and adoration of the universe. As the nations of the saved look upon their Redeemer, that's Jesus, and behold the eternal glory of the Father shining in his countenance as they behold his throne. Jesus has a throne which is from everlasting to everlasting and to know that his kingdom is to have no end. They break forth in rapturous song. This whole thing is about Jesus. She's making a point that it's Jesus that gives it to us. Verse 10, And has made us unto kings and priests, we shall reign on the earth. Early writings, 290. Then I saw thrones, and Jesus and the redeemed saints sat upon them, and the saints reigned as kings and priests of God. Now, when she says God in this sentence, she's talking about Jesus. We cannot be thinking about the Father all the time of Jesus. It's not talking about him. Christ, in union with his people, judged the wicked dead, comparing their acts with a statute book, the word of God, and deciding every case according to the deeds done in the body. Now, there are people in the church saying the statutes are the feasts. No, the statute means law. Then they meted out the wicked and the portion which they must suffer. So the saints will sit with Jesus on his throne and they will go through the investigation of the wicked. For a thousand years they will be doing this. Verse 11. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels. There's the angels again. You can't have the plan without the angels. Round about the throne and the beasts, the others, and the number of them, of the angels was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. <laughs> well, how many is that? We can't count it. 
Councils on Health, page 32. Heavenly intelligences are sent as messengers to the world to unite with human agencies for the salvation of souls. Now, I want to ask you a question. It's in this verse. If the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are everywhere, that's what people say about the Trinity, they are everywhere, then how is it possible for angels, that's who the heavenly agencies are, are sent to this earth? Aren't the angels where the Father is, where Jesus is? Yes, that's called heaven. When Jesus was on this earth, it said he left. Well, how could he leave if he's always every place, all the time? Where would, how could he be sent? Well, he's in heaven, the Bible tells us. He's coming back to the earth. Well, if he never left the earth, why would all that have to be said? We just need to ask these questions. You can't be a Trinitarian believing those weird things if you read the Bible. Testimonies, Volume 6, page 59. Study these revelations. Here are themes worthy of our contemplation, large and comprehensive lessons which all the angelic hosts are now seeking to communicate. Who is communicating to us? Jesus is in heaven. The angels are the ones communicating with us. Jesus is talking through them by his Spirit. You see, the Bible is true. He left the earth. He's in heaven. The angels are communicating to us his thoughts. Behold the life and character of Christ and study his mediatorial work. He's mediating in heaven. That's what he's doing. Letter 79, 1900. Angels. So here, angels. We're getting angels all the way through this were united in the work of him who had broken the seals and taken the book. So the angels are there with Jesus, and the angels are here on the earth. Four mighty angels hold back the powers of this earth till the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. Now, I have to tell you, it doesn't mean four angels. It means four groups of angels. The four groups of angels have the face of a man, the face of an ox, the face, you see? It told us what the fa they looked like. It's bunches of angels, but they're called four angels here. So we've got to get over this scene. The Bible is saying things, and it, that's all it means. No, it's a whole symbol. The nations of the world are eager for conflict, but they are held in check by the angels. When this restraining power is removed, do you notice what she used a word here? Power. There are three powers in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the angels. And she said the angels are a power here. I don't know why we read these things and we don't see them. <laughs> Deadly instruments of warfare will be invented. That's what humanity is doing right now. They have inventions we don't know anything about. Vessels with their living cargo will be entombed in the great deep. All who have not the spirit of truth will unite under the leadership of satanic agencies. But they are to be kept under control till the time shall come for the great battle of Armageddon. I mean, we would be in that battle right now if it wasn't for the group, four groups of angels holding all this back. But the inventions are being done. They're there now. And they're all under control of satanic agencies. There's only two sides, Jesus and Satan. That's all there is. And the people who are not on Jesus' side are 
on Satan's side. That's what we need to get in our heads. If we do not belong to Jesus, if we have not surrendered to him, we are on Satan's side. And we will do what he says. We've got to think about these things. Angels are belting the world, refusing his claims to supremacy made because of the vast multitudes as his adherents. We hear not the voices. We see not with the natural sight the work of these angels. But their hands are linked about the world, and with sleepless vigilance they are keeping the armies of Satan at bay till the sealing of God's people shall be accomplished. So the only reason we're still all here is the angels are doing their work. They're keeping Satan down. Letter 89C, 1897. All these heavenly beings have one object above all others in which they are intensely interested. His church in a world of corruption. So all the angels, that's all they think about. But why is it so important that angels do all this thinking? Because they are the Holy Spirit to us. Jesus is in heaven. People don't like to hear that. But I have to say it again. The angels are holy spirits because they have the Spirit of Christ in them. They are not the Holy Spirit by themselves. It's Jesus in them. That makes them holy spirits. And the humans on earth who also have the Holy Spirit, they are the Holy Spirit to other people. We don't have this down yet. We still think Trinitarian thoughts. We're still thinking Holy Spirit. Oh, that's over there. No, it's in people. It is the person. I don't have time to go over that again. <laughs> We've talked about all these things. We need to remember them. Manuscript 17, 1893. God has angels whose whole work is to draw those who shall be heirs of salvation. Now, in the Bible it says Jesus draws them. But he can't do it personally. He's in heaven. The angels are drawing them to Christ. Whenever one takes a step toward Jesus, Jesus is taking steps toward them. The angels' work is to keep back the powers of Satan. Letter 79, 1900. Holy angels will join in the song of the redeemed. Now, they don't sing that song out of experience, but they've seen it operating in humans. So they'll join in the song. Though they cannot sing from experimental knowledge, he has washed us in his own blood and redeemed us unto God, yet they understand the great peril from which the people of God have been saved. So they don't know the experience for themselves, but they see the experience in God's people. So they sing with them. Were they not sent? Every time that word sent, it's telling us there's no trinity. Have you seen that yet? Do you know that? The word sent means there's no trinity because the trinity is omniscient, omnipresent, and that means every place. That means heaven isn't over there and earth is over here. The word sent means, okay? We need to know that. We see that little word. That little word wipes out the Trinity. <laughs> One word. And yet there are lots of words in the Bible we can talk about. But I'm just saying these things now because we've seen enough things. We can begin to see it. Yes, that's true. Sent means going here to there. And if everywhere is everywhere, they don't need to be sent. <laughs> Were they not sent to lift up for them a standard against the enemy? They can fully sympathize with the glowing ecstasy of those who have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word 
of their testimony. Now, the word of their testimony is about the Bible. The Bible is true. That's their testimony. Now, the only ones who can say it's true are the people who believe it and live it and have it. <laughs> Review and Error, July 4th, 1899. The work of these heavenly beings, angels again, is to prepare the inhabitants of this world to become children of God, pure, holy, undefiled. That's the work. We are to become holy pure, undefiled. But men, though professing to be the followers of Christ, do not place themselves in a position where they can understand this ministry. You see, we're saying things as we go along here to give us understanding. But people, most of the people in the church have no understanding of these things. And thus the work of the heavenly messengers is made hard. The angels who do always behold the face of the Father in heaven would prefer to remain by the side of God. Now, when I say Father in heaven, it's either the Father of Jesus or it's Jesus himself. Jesus is the Father in heaven. So you have to make up your own mind what it's talking about there. In the pure and holy atmosphere of heaven, but a work must be done in bringing this heavenly atmosphere to the souls who are tempted and tried. That's Jesus. And Satan may not disqualify them for the place the Lord would have them fill in the heavenly courts. Principalities and powers in heavenly places combine with these angels in their ministration for those who shall be heirs of salvation. But how sad it is that this work is hindered by the coarseness, the roughness, the worldly-mindedness of men and women who are so desirous of securing their own ends, of gratifying their own wishes, that they lose sight of the word of God, which should be their instructor and their guide. The Lord gives to every angel his work for this fallen world. Now, there are billions of angels, and every Christian has an angel that's been assigned. That angel goes to heaven every now and then, taking messages. And other angels, thousands of them, still surround these people until the angel comes back. So we're never without the angels. And when I say thousands, I mean thousands of angels. That's how many are around to keep the evil angels away if we want them kept away. You see, they don't do a thing until we make a decision. Divine help is provided for men and women. They have the opportunity of cooperating with the heavenly intelligences of being laborers together with God. There is placed before them the possibility of gaining a fitness for the presence of God, of being enabled to see him face to face. Now I'm going to stop at that sentence. It says they are given an opportunity, the possibility of gaining. When we join the church, we have the possibility of seeing the Father face to face. But it's only a possibility. It's not automatic because we believe in the cross. It's something we can gain eternally. Heavenly angels are working to bring the human family into close brotherhood. A oneness described by Christ is like the, that existing between the Father and the Son. Satanic agencies are always warring for the mastery over the human mind, but the angels of God are constantly at work strengthening the weak hands and confirming the feeble knees of all who call upon God for help. So the angels are always there 
wanting to do for humans what we don't easily want for ourselves. Verse 12 saying with a loud voice, by the way, everything I'm reading here has to do with chapter 5. And Alan White says we need to study that chapter. And angels are all the way through these comments. Verse 12 saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Now, I know we can't imagine it now, what that's going to be like for us to sing that. But we ought to try to understand when we finally will be able to say, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. And he's not slain anymore. We see him standing there. He said, I was dead, but now I'm alive. That ought to mean something. He was dead, and he's alive. Desire of Ages 131. Never can the cost of our redemption be realized until the redeemed shall stand with the Redeemer before the throne of God. Then, as the glories of the eternal home burst upon our enraptured senses, we shall remember that Jesus left all of this for us. That he not only became an exile from the heavenly courts, but for us took the risk of failure and eat eternal loss. How could Jesus lose everything, including eternity? He can't do that as a Trinitarian. He can't do that because he never suffered as a Trinity God. He never was involved in what the human did. He wasn't there when the human died, according to Trinitarians. But according to this statement and many others like it, Jesus died, and if he hadn't been successful, he would have stayed dead forever. Now, I know you've read Desire of Ages. Maybe you missed this statement, because people still don't know that Jesus died. They would rather take another statement where she says divinity can't die, and they think they know everything then. But she says he couldn't do it as a god. He had to become a human. That's how he died. Then we shall cast our crowns at his feet and raise the song, Worthy is the Lamb. Now can you imagine what kind of a mess that's going to be? Billions of crowns at the feet of Jesus. And now when it's all over, you've sung your song, you've said it, now you have to go find your crown. <laughs> the Acts of the Apostles, page 601. What sustained the Son of God during his life of toil and sacrifice? Now, when she says Son of God here, she's counting the human in divinity, both of them, because it was, he was combined. He saw the results of the travail of his soul. That's Isaiah, and was satisfied, looking into eternity. He beheld the happiness of those who through his humiliation had received pardon and everlasting life. You see, you don't receive pardon and go to heaven. You have to also get everlasting life. Did you see that in that sentence? His ear caught the shout of the redeemed. He heard the ransomed one. Who are the ransomed ones? That is all the redeemed. Notice what they sing. Singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. That's not how it looks like in Great Controversy 648. In that chapter, somebody changed the wording around to make it look like that's just the Seventh-day Adventists. But she doesn't say in the Seventh-day Adventist series, she says the redeemed. 
So you better go study and find out how the redeemed can sing that song. We may have a vision of the future, the blessedness of heaven. By faith we may stand at the threshold of the eternal city and hear the gracious welcome given to those who in this life cooperate with Christ. Not when he comes back. Not when he does the magic thing. No, it's how we live before he came. Letter 89, C, 1897 again. Oh, that all could behold our precious Savior as he is. A savior. Let his hand draw aside the veil which conceals his glory from our eyes. What his glory? We read it last week. It's his holiness. That's his glory. It shows him in his high and holy place. What do we see? Our savior. Our savior. Now please understand that. Jesus came to this world to save us. He's not the savior of anybody else. He's our savior. He's our God. Not in a position of silence and inactivity. That's what it says in Mystery of Healing 417. Jesus is there at his throne without silence. But everybody thinks that's talking about the Heavenly Father. It is the Heavenly Father. It's Jesus. <laughs> what do we see? Our Savior. He is surrounded with heavenly intelligence. That's what it says in the ministry of healing. Cherubim and seraphim, 10,000 times 10,000. That's exactly what it says on that page in the ministry of healing. But we put the wrong person there. Verse 13, saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne. Great Controversy 545 and 678. Thus will be made an end of sin, with all the woe and ruin which have resulted from it. There will then be no lost souls to blaspheme God, as they ride in never-ending torment, nor wretched beings in hell would mingle their shrieks to the songs of the saved. Okay, 678 says, The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and godness beats to the vast creation from him who created all, that's Jesus, flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space from the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy. Declare that God is love. That's the end of the five books. That's the way the first book begins. God is love. <laughs> so the whole controversy begins and ends with those three words. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 541. The Feast of Tabernacles was not only commemorative but typical. It not only pointed back to the wilderness sojourn, but as the Feast of Harvest, it celebrated the ingathering of the fruits of the earth and pointed forward to the great day of final ingathering. So the Feast of Tabernacles is just not a feast on the earth. This is coming. Desire of Ages, 835. Songs of triumph mingled with the music from angel harps till heaven seems to overflow with joy and praise. Love has conquered, the lost is found. Story of Redemption, page 432. The more men learn of God, the greater will 
be their admiration at his character. As Jesus opens before them the riches of redemption and the amazing achievements in the great controversy with Satan, the hearts of the ransom beat with stronger devotion, and they sweep the harps of gold with a firmer hand, and ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands of voices unite to swell the mighty chorus of praise. That's chapter five. Now we're going to look at chapter six. <laughs> we don't have a lot of time here, but we'll do what we can. Verse 2 says, I saw and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Testimonies, volume 8, page 41. In vision I saw two armies in terrible conflict. One army was led by banners bearing the world's insignia. The other was led by the blood-stained banner of Prince Emmanuel. The battle raged. Only two. Victory alternated from side to side. Oh. The captain of our salvation was ordering the battle and sending support to his soldiers. At last, the victory was gained. This is the scene that is presented to me. But the church must and will fight against seen and unseen foes, Satan's agencies in human form are on the ground. Satan's agencies in human form that's right, they're all around us in human form, but they are satanic. We ought to think about that. We're not dealing with just humans. We're dealing with Satan's forces. Acts of the Apostles, page 48. What was the result of the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost? Now, we read what happened on the day of Pentecost. Do you remember what happened on that day? It said, the Holy Spirit was poured out, and 3,000 souls were baptized. Do you remember what that pouring out of the Holy Spirit was? Well, in the Bible it says, it was tongues of fire. And we read Spirit of Prophecy that went back to Hebrews, the first chapter, where it says, His angels are turned into fire. It was the angels that were the tongues of fire that came to the 3,000 men that were converted. That's what we said in that meeting, and I hope you're remembering some of that. She says here, what was the result of the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost? It was not a third God. It was the angels. The glad tidings of risen Savior was carried to the uttermost parts of the inhabited world. The angels, not the Holy Spirit by himself as a third God. The angels carried the Holy Spirit to the people. I'm making this point because we have to see something, and we must know it. Acts of the Apostles. In the days of the Apostles, the Christian believers were filled with earnestness and enthusiasm. So untiringly did they labor for their master that in a comparative short time, notwithstanding fierce opposition, the gospel of the kingdom was sounded to all the inhabited parts of the earth. The zeal manifested at this time by the followers of Jesus has been recorded by the pen of inspiration for the encouragement of the believers in every age. Now, I don't have it here, but she says, the acts of the day of Pentecost, 
will happen again. The Holy Spirit will be poured out. How? Each Christian will have the Holy Spirit to give to others. The day of Pentecost is going to be repeated. But none of the churches seem to understand this. They don't know anything about it. But the day of Pentecost is coming again. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 754. He that saw on him had a bow. When the stronghold of kings shall be overthrown, when the arrows of God's wrath shall strike through the hearts of his enemies, his people will be safe in his hands. There will be a crown involved. Zive of Ages 549. The crown and the throne are the tokens of a condition attained. They are the tokens of self-conquest through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some of the best evangelists in our church, and I could name them, say that Christianity is not attained. It is a gift. Well, here it says it's attained. Who are we going to believe? The whole church is being taught you can't attain Christianity. Now, I'm reading things that just should shake us up because we have believed so many lies. Verse 4. I didn't read about the white horse, did I? The white horse has to do with victory. Now, verse 4, a horse that was red. Testimonies, Volume 4, page 120. This heifer was to be red, which was a symbol of blood. That's all we'll do on the red horse. We, we have the whole book of Revelation to get through. Testimonies, Volume 1, page 190. Given unto him a great sword. Many I saw were flattering themselves. They were good Christians who have not a single ray of light from heaven. Not a single ray of light. And I saw that the Lord was wetting his sword in heaven to cut them down. He's getting his sword ready to cut down Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, people don't read these correctly. They don't see what it's saying. A black horse. Each son and daughter of Adam chooses either Christ or Barabbas. Now, that's what Pilate did. He brought uh, Barabbas right there in front of him and put, set him right next to Christ and said, which one do you want? And they said, give us Barabbas. And he couldn't believe his ears. <laughs> he said, well, what should I do with Christ? They said, crucify him. Just like that, crucify him. All who place themselves on the side of the disloyal are standing under Satan's black banner and are charged with rejecting and despitefully using Christ. That's Review and Herald, June 30th, 1900. A pair of balances in his hand. Testimonies, Volume 1, page 186. Said the angel, God is weighing his people. 189 says, Your pride your love to follow the fashions of the world, your vain and empty conversations, your selfishness are all put in the scales and the weight of evil is fearfully against you. Testimony, Volume 5, page 83. The church will be weighed in the balances of the sanctuary. If her moral character and spiritual state do not correspond with the benefits and blessings God has conferred upon her, she will be found wanting. Now, when Ellen White says the church in a place like this, is she talking about the bricks and the stones and the flowers and all that? No, she's talking about the people who join the church, the people. And she says many of them are going to be found wanting. Great Controversy, page 31. And we ought to read that first chapter, entire chapter, over and over again until we know what it's saying. Terrible were the calamities 
that fell upon Jerusalem when the siege was resumed by Titus. The city was invested at the time of the Passover when millions of Jews were assembled within its walls. That's really a little bit hard to get a hold of because back in the old days there was a wall around the city and it, you wouldn't think millions could get inside there. But she says it. We ought to think about what is she saying. Their stores of provision, which if carefully preserved, would have supplied the inhabitants for years, have previously been destroyed through the jealousy and revenge of the contending factions, and now all the horrors of starvation were experienced. A measure of wheat was sold for a talent. Verse 6, And see, thou hurt not the oil and wine. Volume 5, page 614. See, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Well, this is quite a statement. See, you hurt not the oil and the wine. There's not time to get into all of that. We just hit a part. In view of the infinite price paid for man's redemption, how dare any professing the name of Christ treat with indifference one of his little ones? How carefully should brethren and sisters in the church guard every word and action lest they hurt the oil and the wine. Great Controversy 394. The wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. The latter class had received the grace of God. That's the oil. The grace of God, the regenerating, enlightening power of the Holy Spirit. It's the oil of Jesus, which renders his word a lamp to the feet and the light of the path. That's Jesus making a light out of his Bible. In the fear of God, they had studied the scriptures to learn the truth and earnestly sought for purity of heart and life. Now, only the pure ones are Christians. These had a personal experience of faith in God and in his word, the word of Jesus, and which could not be overthrown by disappointment and delay. Others took their lamps, that's the Bible, and took no oil with them. They didn't take anything of the power of God with them. They had moved from impulse. Their fears had been excited by the solemn message, but they had depended upon the faith of their brethren, satisfied with the flickering light of good emotions without a thorough understanding of the truth or a genuine work of grace, the oil of God in the heart. Christ Object Lessons, page 407, the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Now, what these statements are saying are not complete the Holy Spirit of Christ. If we would say that when you see the Holy Spirit statements, we'd understand what the Bible is saying partially. If we don't understand what angels are, the part they play in the plan of salvation, we still won't understand. If we leave the angels out, we've left out part of the plan of salvation. Review and Herald, December 22nd, 1904. The golden oil represents the Holy Spirit. With this oil, God's ministers are to be constantly supplied that they in turn may impart it to the church, not by mind nor by power, but my spirit. That's Jesus talking, saith the Lord of hosts. You see, we have not read the Bible the way it reads. We have put all kinds of Trinitarian thoughts into it. Desire of Ages, page 149. The wine which God provided for the feast and that which he gave to the disciples as a symbol of his own blood was the pure juice of the grape. So the blood, his blood, is represented by the juice. Verse 9. 
And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar of souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they have. Manuscript 39, 1906. When the fifth seal was opened, John the Revelator in vision saw beneath the altar the company that were slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. After this came the scenes described in the 18th of Revelation, when these who are faithful and true are called out from Babylon. All right, we'll do one more. Verse 10. They cried, saying with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord? Testimonies 5, 4, and 51. As the approach of the Roman armies is a sign to the disciples of the impending destruction of Jerusalem, so may this apostasy be a sign to us that the limit of God's forbearance is reached, that the measure of our nation's iniquity is full, and that the angel of mercy is about to take her flight, never to return. So the United States, the legislators, are going to pass a law, and when they pass that law, mercy is over and the angel will never return. The people of God will then be plunged into those scenes of affliction and distress which prophets have described as the time of Jacob's trouble. The cries of the faithful persecuted ones ascend to heaven. And as the blood of Abel cried from the ground, there are voices also crying to God from martyrs' graves, from the sepulchres of the sea, from mountain caverns, for convent vaults. How long, O oh Lord? Well, it won't be very long after that. The final events will be rapid ones. They'll come very quickly. So we're beginning to see some things now. We'll continue next time with that chapter 6. Our Father, we are seeing things now with a revelation that we may not have known before. Make them real to us. Help us to see what you've shown us. Let us make the preparation that we will be with Jesus. To do that, we'll take everything we have. Help us. Give us strength to be overcomers.